All right, so we're going to be talking about the art, health, and history, or I'm sorry, art, health, and PE sections of the fine arts exam. The art section is our first competency. It's going to focus on the foundational understanding of fine arts con content and concepts and skill the skills necessary for effective teaching and learning in this domain. This section, I know, scares a lot about every pe a lot of people, the art and music. But keep in mind, this is also the shortest exam on the test, shortest portion of the test, the shortest section, and it's, but it's also got the least amount of time. The art can come in a lot of different forms. Um, I listed some of them here, but... I think most of us are familiar with the fact that you can see art in a lot of different ways. It's not just a painting. Whenever we talk about art, we also talk about sculptures. We talk about the drama. All the different pieces that make up art. All right, so foundations of art. What is art built upon? We're going to introduce the concept, the archaea elements of principles of fine arts. And this is going to be your elements like line, shape, color, texture, space, and form. We're going to talk about the principles of art, which is your balance, unity, contrast, rhythm, uh, emphasis, and proportions. We're also going to talk today about how we understand the role of the aesthetics and the artistic expression. All our um, We're going to talk about some of the different aesthetic theories and talk about what this means for our classrooms. So let's get back into the elements of art. I included the visual because to me, the visual makes it easier to remember and understand each of the different ones. So line is obvious. Line it refers to a path created by a moving point. Um, keep in mind, whenever we're talking about lines, it doesn't have to be straight. It can be curved, it can be jagged. Is it thick, is it thin? Or it can be a combination of any of these characteristics. Um, artists use lines to define their shapes, to create texture, to imply movement, um, or even direction within an artwork. Then we go on to shapes. Shapes refer to the uh, two-dimensional areas that are enclosed, of course. We all know that from elementary. I think you learned that in kindergarten, what a shape is. We know that they can be circles, squares, triangles. Um, whenever we talk about shapes, we also talk about inorganic shapes, though, that they can be irregular. They can be freeform shapes. They don't have to be one of the ones you memorized when you were little. Um, they can be flat. And they are flat. Oops, I don't know why mine are in a different order. All right, so color. Color is the most expressive element of art. That's the one that whenever we think of art, usually we think of first is what colors are is it used. And it is produced by the reflection or absorption of light waves, of course, by the surface of the object. Color has three primary characteristics. Hue, which is the name of the color. Value, which is the lightness or darkness of the color. And the intensity, which is the brightness or dullness of the color. And I have those three words on another slide with their definition. So that's easier for you to take a picture of it. Artists use color to evoke emotions, to convey meaning, and to create visual interest in their work. Sorry, my notes are in a different order than this picture, but that's okay. Um, texture refers to the surface quality or the feel of an object. It can be perceived through touch or visually. It can actually it can be an actual texture where they've changed the texture of the art, or they can do it. Uh, like I said, using different lines or shading to make it look like a different texture. Texture adds richness and depth to the artwork. It enhances the visual and tactile appeal. All right, let's go over here to space. Space refers to the area within and around objects in an artwork. It creates, we, you can create positive space, uh, through the shapes or forms of self or negative space, which is empty space around or between the objects. Artists manipulate space to create depth, perspective, and spatial relationships within their comp compositions. We have form. This is our 3D shapes. 
unlike shapes which are flat, these have depth and volume. And I mean, you can see the difference in what a 3D and 2D shape is. We all know that, so I'm not going to go into detail about that. But these are used, form is used to cr is created through the use of light, shadows, perspective, and giving objects a sense of solidarity and presence. Which one am I missing? Value. Value refers to the lightness or darkness of tones or colors within the artwork. It's created by the contrast between light and shadow. And it's essential for defining shapes, creating volume, and establishing mood or atmosphere. Value is often described described on a scale from uh, ranging from white, which is our lightest value, to black, with various shades of gray in between. So all of these elements are art are related, and they work together to create a visual harmony, balance, and meaning in artwork. And then artists use, can manipulate these uh, deliberately to communicate their ideas, emotions, and experience to viewers. All right, so let's talk about the principles of design. And I put the basic definitions of these on here so that it'd be easy if you, because I know a lot of people like to take their screenshots or their pictures, but that way you have them. So principles of design are of art or guidelines or rules such that artists use to organize the elements of their art within the composition. Within the elements of art provide the basic building blocks uh, or the principles of art offer a framework for arranging these elements effectively to create visually appealing and meaningful artwork. So we'll go through each of these and talk about them just like we did in the other one. Um, balance refers to the distribution or visual weight within an artwork. There's three different types of balance that artists can use. Symmetrical balance uh, is whenever the elements are even on both sides of the picture across the central axis, creating a sense of stability or harmony. Asymmetrical balance is when the visual weight is distributed unevenly, but still achieves equilibrium, either through careful arrangement of ele elements to, with varying size, color, texture, shape. And then radial balance, ele elements radiate outward from the central point, creating a circular or spiral composition. All right, so emphasis. Emphasis is also known as a focal point. It's the principle of drawing attention to a particular area or element within an artwork. This can be achieved through contrast, isolation, placement, size, or color to create a focal point that captures the visual attention and guides the interpretation of the artwork. Unity refers to the sense of cohesion and completeness in the artwork. It's achieved through the harmonious arrangement of elements. It all, it's, um, involves creating a sense of visual wholeness or coherence, where all parts of the composition work together to convey a unified concept or me message. We have variety, which involves incorporating diversity and contrast within an artwork to create visual interest and complexity. Movement refers to the visual flow or a sense of movement created within an artwork. It's usually achieved through the arrangement of elements, implied lines or shapes, directional cues, and the use of repetition or rhythm to guide the viewer's eye. Rhythm is the repetition or alternation of elements within an artwork to create a sense of visual tempo or beat. We know what proportion is. That's a common word for us. Uh, it refers to the relationship between the sizes of different elements within an artwork. Harmony involves that combination of element and principles to create a pleasing and un unified whole. The principles of art serve as guidelines for the artist, but we all know that they don't necessarily follow them. It's just one of those things that we see in a lot of the art, and it helps us as we're viewing it. It helps them create visually compelling and meaningful artwork, it allows them to effectively communicate ideas, emotions, and experiences to viewers. All right, our color wheel. Hopefully, we've all at least seen this at some point before. We know our primary colors are the red, blue, and yellow. They're our standalone colors. There's nothing you can mix up to make those colors. Our secondary colors are 
it, it, to me, it's the easiest way to think of these is like if I'm using paint. Our secondary colors are created by mixing two of the primary colors. So this is going to be your orange, purple, and green. Your terretiary colors, sorry, my pronunciations are horrible, guys, is whenever you mix a primary and secondary color. Sorry, I cannot talk at all today. And if I'm moving too fast, guys, just tell me and I'll slow down, okay? All right, our complementary colors are going to be across from each other on the wheel. So your red and green, blue and orange, yellow and purple. Um, complementary colors are combos that tend to be bold. A lot of times sports teams, they use them. Um, artists, they use them to really bring out different areas of their painting. Our analogous colors are going to be side by side. So it'd be like the red and the red purple. Our warm colors are going to be everything from, let's see. I want to say it starts with the uh, red, purple, but it's your red, yellow, orange, all of this area right here. And then your cool colors are going to be over here. And the whole point of knowing these things is so that whenever artists are, cre are painting or doing their art, they're able to create color harmony. And the idea of color harmony is it's the color theory that the property that certain colors are going to give you an aesthetically appealing combination together. They're going to look good together. So that's the whole point of artists knowing these ideas is that it helps them to be able to create paintings that look good together or create color harmony. All right, here's some more specific definitions. Just I put these all together so that it was easy in case I missed anything. And so because these didn't really fit in anywhere. But we know hue is any specific color. Um, tone is whenever we're a color made by adding gray, different amounts of gray to it. So you can see it gets lighter or darker. Value is the degree of light or darkness. Um, achromatic is your black, white, and grays. It's any it's artwork that has no color in it. Black is the absence of color. Um, chroma is the intensity or strength or purity of a color. Shade is whenever you mix a color, uh, black with another color and you make it darker. Spectrum is the colors that are a result of a beam of white light that is broken by a prism into hues. And then tint, which is combining white with a color to make it lighter. Oh All right. Some of our different theories of art. Autistic theories of art are philosophical frameworks or perspectives that seek to understand the nature, purpose, and value of art. These theories explore questions about what constitutes art and how it should be interpreted and what criteria should be used to judge its quality or significance. Um, each of these theories provide a different lens or way of look at, at, that individuals can look and analyze art. So formalism um, expresses the intrinsic qualities of the artwork, such as its form, composition, color, line, texture. Um, according to the formalistic theory, the values and meaning of art are derived mainly from the formal elements rather than the external factors such as the historical contrast or the artist's intentions. They believe that the art should be appreciated for its aesthetic qualities and formal integrity, independent of its subject matter or cultural significance. Expressionism focuses on the emotional side of things and the psychological expression conveyed by the artist. This theory emphasizes that the art's subjective experience and inner feelings are driving forces behind the creation. So they believe that the art serves as a medium for personal or collective expression 
and allows artists to communicate their thoughts, emotions, experiences to viewers. Imitationalism. It's also it's also known as realism or mimet mimet. Uh, I can't even talk today. Mimetic theory, and it emphasizes the ability of art so to represent or imitate reality. So, according to this theory, the value of art lies in its ability to depict the external world accurately and convincingly. So, they value artwork that demonstrates the technical skill, accuracy, and fidelity to nature. So, viewing art should be a reflection of the actual world. Uh, institutional theory. This one you won't, I highly doubt you'll have to worry about. But just so you'll know, it focuses on the social and cultural context that define art and shape its reception. This theory emphasizes the role of the institution, such as the museums, the galleries, and the critics, and the art markets in determining what is considered art. It also looks at how it's valued. So in in institutionalists argue that the state of art is determined by its acceptance within the institutional framework rather than its qualities. So the painting can be ugly, but if everyone loves it, it and it's seen a lot and respected a lot, then it's a better painting. Postmodernism, it challenges traditional notions of art and aesthetics. It questions the authority of established norms and conventions. Postmodernists reject the idea of a fixed definition of art or a universal standard of beauty. They advocate for diversity, plurality, and exploration in artistic expression. Postmodern art often incorporates irony, appreciate uh, appropriation, and deconstruction to challenge conventional boundaries and subvert established hierarchies. And then functionalism focuses on the pr practical or unit. Can't even talk today, guys. On the practical aspects of art, it emphasizes its role in fulfilling human needs and purposes. This theory views art as a form of social practice or a cultural production that serves various functions, such as how to communicate, rituals, decorations, political expression. Functionalists examine how art operates within a specific cultural context in society, so it considers the social, economic, and ideological dimensions of the art. But each of these different perspectives on the nature and purpose of art offer uh, valuable insights and diversity. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of different theories and different ways that people can view art and see what art is considered good or important or how it contributes to society. All right, so let's look at the next part, exploration and the creative process. So how is art created? We, uh, we know creating is just engaging in the process of making the art. Performing is the executing or the presenting of the art. Responding is going to be the interpreting or critiquing of the art. And then connecting is relating the art to personal experience and other disciplines or cultural experiences. For example, when you create, you might, this is like when uh, painting a landscape, then you might hang it up hang it up to so that other people can see it. Other people are going to view your art and critique it. And then your others are going to look at it and see how, explore how the theme of this piece relates to history or relates to literacy works or to their everyday life. We know there's, we talked a little bit at the beginning about how there's lots of different ways to create art. We have different mediums and techniques. Oops. We're creating art. I showed a few, some of them here. There is a lot more out there. Just keep in mind that there's going to be different ways to create art. And one of the things I did want to point out is we talked a bit a little about how we could use lines. If you see like how the different lines are done, even in this charcoal and the graphite, how they can use them to create that value, to create the darkness and lightness. We can use different hatch marks to create different textures. If they vary how they use their instruments, they can create a completely different image. All right. 
So teaching art techniques. There's two main ways of to teach art. And the one and I tried to choose pictures for these. The one on the left is called divergent instruction. The one on the right is construct convergent construction. They're kind of like opposite sides of the world. Convergent instruction focuses on, or I'm sorry, divergent construction focuses and emphasis on creativity, exploration, self-expression. You, it encourages the students to generate multiple solutions or interpretations for a problem. Um, teachers often use divergent instruction whenever they present open-ended prompts or challenges, and they allow the students to create a wide range of possible responses. It's really good to allow students to to explore the various techniques and materials without having to give them rigid constraints. For example, a teacher might say, like in my bottom, uh, they might use a theme to inspire the art. So show me an ocean with fish and let the kids explore how they want to do that themselves. This is called process art. And I could teach a whole lesson on process art because I'm a firm believer in process art that the process of them exploring is so much more important than the actual final final project. Because to me, process art is how students learn. But I'm not going to go off on my, my personal opinion here on that. <laughs> Convergent instruction is uh, instruction that focuses on achieving a specific outcome or mastering predetermined skills or techniques. It aims to get, guide students towards a single con constant answer. For example, I put this picture here at the bottom. This is whenever you think of, I'm going to give you the example of the picture of our project or craft that we're creating. Everybody's picture should look like mine when we're done. It's very closed-ended. They want one specific outcome. They often emphasize using different techniques or adherence to different principles to make sure that you're getting the same outcome and you're mastering those same skills. Right. Both of these approaches uh, have their merits and value and their time that you should do them, but it's really just knowing the difference in divergent and convergent, that divergent is going to be your creative open-ended, convergent is going to be your crafts that have a specific guideline of what you want them to accomplish. All right, let's look at our pedagogical implications. Because this is always important. We want to think about how are we teaching this in the classroom? What does this actually look like in our classroom? What do we need to consider for it in our classroom? So we want to think about how are we going to differentiate our instruction? We want to recognize the diverse needs of and interests and abilities of our students. We want to make sure we're implying those differentiated strategies to tailor the approaches. Um, in the context of fine arts education, this may be providing various entry points for students to engage with the concepts. For instance, offering different mediums and approaches to the artwork for creating artwork, because not all students will be able to create it the same way. Additionally, it's providing options for demonstrating or understanding, such as through visual arts, performances, reflections, and then accommodating the students' strengths and preferences as needed. We want to look at our interdisciplinary uh, integration. We know that we can put we can use art in all of our different subjects. You want to make sure you're connecting art with subjects like history, literature, science, and math, so that the students can gain a deeper understanding of each area and develop those critical thinking skills. For example, whenever they're studying the art of a particular historical period, you can you're you're talking about the history of that time, but you're also able to bring in the art and show them what the art looks like and how it's provided insight into their social, political, and cultural context. The aesthetic assessments. Um, aesthetic assessments in art sometimes look different. It's not going to be a written test typically, even though I know it, even in my daughter's school, I've seen written tests in her art class. Not exactly what you usually think of as a test, but they can be used to see if the Educators can design assessment tasks that allow students to demonstrate that they understand and the skills that are in each of the areas they're working on. For example, if they're testing on form, on form, they might be checking the line. They might be checking if there's 2D shapes. 
They might be checking to see if there's value represented. They're checking all the different things that they need to for that assessment. Um, a lot of times you'll see them, you have to use a rubric so that they can see, check what they're looking for. Uh, culturally responsive teaching. This is recognizing that the cultural diversity of students and the importance of their cultural reverence, relevance in art education. We want to make sure that educators are showing them different types of art that show different cultures, not just one specific area. We want to exp expose them to all the different types of art that they can, a wide ra range of cultural expression. That way they can learn to appreciate the diverse perspectives from the artistic community. And of course, we always want to make sure we're aligning everything with TEKS just to uh, make sure we're in our curriculum standards because, of course, everything has to be aligned to TEKS in everything we do. Um, this is just some more vocabulary, about specifically about paintings. Um. We background and foreground are pretty obvious. Most of us know what that is. Most of us know what the horizon line is. Um, landscape is going to be your outdoor scenes, view of the of a section of country. Mid ground is going to be that area between our background and foreground. Like I said, most of these are pretty obvious things that we've heard of before. I just wanted to put them all together just so you have that in one place. All right, so let's get into some questions because I feel like I've been talking a long time and I think everybody fell asleep on me. All right, an EC teacher, the early childhood teacher, gives children an art activity of illustrating and labeling plants or animals by name that they learned about in science unit. This best exemplifies which application of art, learning application of art. All right, what do we think of those answer choices? Do we see anything we want to eliminate, anything we want to highlight? What are you ladies thinking today? Um, illustrating and labeling. Okay. So we're going to highlight illustrating and labeling. Anything else we need to highlight? For me, I'd want to come back over here and highlight the EC, the early childhood. Just because we always want to highlight that grade level, it may not make a difference on this question, but it does on other questions. That grade level is important, so we will make a habit of always highlighting that first. All right, now what do we think of the choices? Any of them we like, dislike? I like the first one. Okay, why? Um, Because the other ones seem really focused on the art aspect. Because okay. like the last one about telling stories, expressing feelings and thoughts, I don't really think that's what this activity is about when they're labeling. Um, yeah, I would say that doesn't seem to animal. connect with the activity. I agree. Are we uh, are we going to, in our early childhood, think you're four-year-olds, you're three and four-year-olds. Are you really having them, by having them illustrate and label plants and animals, are they developing line, shape, color, and textures at all? That's not I really important. Yeah I, say, yeah, I would say that's not really what we're trying to do at all. That's <laughs> are we uh, developing skills of color recognition and description? Like, told you guys, I cannot read today for nothing. Color recognition and discrimination. <laughs> are we having them discriminate colors at all in this? No. No. Even though all of these are different applications of art that we're going to have our students do only one of these really even tries to answer that que this question and that's going to be our first one they're trying to use art to help build these students language skills and vocabularies because they're talking about and labeling these plants and animals and odds are you may need them to help you tell you what plants and animals they're drawing because you may not be able to tell so that vocabulary skills are going to be important Let's look at the next one. When planning an art project or activity for young children, what should the teacher do first? What are we going to highlight?
Young children? Yep, we're going to highlight our young children. And for me, I would highlight first. Because probably all of these are going to be things we need to do, but which one's going to be first in the process? All right, so what do we think of our choices? The third one, maybe? Okay, you like the third one? Why? Mm -hmm. Because the first one, or I think the first thing would be to, like, decide... What kind of like peaks you want? Mm -hmm. So I like what you're thinking. I like the fact that you immediately went to that backward design. What am I trying to teach the students? So if we're using that backward design, because all of our lessons are supposed to be backward designed, where we start with our end result and then work towards how we're going to do that. We know we're not going to do this first one. We're not going to start out by just creating a product for them to copy. Because we don't know, we have to know what we're teaching in order to decide what kind of product. I'm looking at the last one. Okay, identify I've... teacher objectives for planning yes. instruction. Yes. All right, so whenever we're playing this, what this one's saying, and I think it's how it's worded, makes it kind of weird, is this uh -huh. one's saying that you're going to look at what your objectives are. How are you supposed to plan and instruct? So first, you, before you can start, you have to think about, as a teacher, what is your uh, objective? So that's kind of a weird one, but we're not going to start out by thinking about looking at our objectives. Um, we were really on the right track with the backward design and it's going to come down to the, these two right here. Are we establishing which particular concept we want to teach or are we determining the learning objectives? So I know y'all all had to write some lesson plans this year, right? I hope. Yes. All right. I know these are worded weird with technical terms. When you're doing your lesson plan, what's the first thing you do on the lesson plan? Your teeth first. Okay. You decide what you want to teach, right? Yes. Af that's our first step. After you decide what you're going to teach, you put that teeth down. What's the second thing you have you do? Uh your objective. Your objective. So this is actually our second thing usually. Because we can't write our objectives because that's gonna be using writing our teak in plain language. This right here, when they say particular concept. Which teach which teak are you teaching? Which particular teak are you teaching? So that's actually gonna make this one first. And I know they're worded kind of weird because they're using different terms than we use. But the, all of this is saying is which teak are you gonna teach? Then you're going to determine which learning objectives that you want the children to meet. Then we're going to work on doing our planning and instruction. How are we going to, what do we need to do to plan for this? How are we going to teach this? Are we doing a whole group, small group, or what are we going to do to teach it? Okay, now that I know what I'm teaching, I know my objectives of what I want them to learn. I know how I'm going to teach it. Okay, so what are they actually making? What is the final product going to look like? Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. I know sometimes when we change the wording of things, it can make it look, it makes these other answers look good, though. <laughs> it was very tricky, for sure. It is. And that's why I want us to make sure we talk through this one, because it's one of those, everyone on here I know knows what backward design is. I know we know how to do those lesson plans. We know what the correct answer is, but the way they word it, it makes us want to choose a different one. All right. So what can preschool children learn from lessons about visual art or elements of line? Get my highlighter. 
We know we're going to highlight this preschool. What else do we need to highlight? Elements of line. Yeah, we want to make sure we're teaching them the elements of line. All right, so what do we think of our choices? Anything we like, don't like? Maybe the third one again. Okay. Everybody's scared to talk now after the last question. <laughs> I, I, I agree with her, the third one, I think. Okay. Well, we like the third one, so let's look at the other one and see what we think of them. This will not help them make better comparisons. What do we think of that choice? Well, we know that the element of line is important. It is going to be one of the things we use whenever we're comparing art. So, yes, even from the preschool age, we know that them learning the element of art is important for them to be able to compare artwork. All right. Children's symbol recognition will not be affected. I'm going to skip that one because it's going to go directly in contrast with that one. So, about preschoolers cannot distinguish among line types. What do we think of that choice? I think it's kind of negative, so I wouldn't choose that one. Yeah, I mean, you ask a four-year-old, is this a straight line or a curvy yeah. line? They can tell you if it's straight or curvy. And I'm telling you, even if you draw your line and ask them, okay, is this a straight line or a curvy line? They can call you out real fast. Oh, no, you curved it. It slants right there. They are brutally honest. <laughs> And they are going to be able to tell you if you made a mistake and it ain't perfectly straight. <laughs> so whatever you're doing, your example, you have to really emphasize. See, this one's my curvy line. This one's my straight line. Because they will call you out real fast. So yeah, they can definitely distinguish among the line types. So then we get to the last two that are kind of opposites. Children's symbol recognition will not be affected or children or ability to recognize shapes will develop. Does anyone work with the kindergarten class or pre-K class? Uh, pre-K. Okay, pre-K. Have you all done shapes this year? Uh, yeah. Okay. And I'm putting you on the spot. I'm sorry. How would you explain that shape to a student? Or how would a, your student explain that shape to you? Um, well, hopefully they would tell me that it has three sides. Uh, maybe something that they've seen. Okay. How about um, this one? Maybe wheels. It looks like wheels. It looks like wheels. And they probably said it got no sides. It's got no sharp points, right? Yeah. It's not straight. So we know that they are able to tell us that they, whenever we're starting to teach them to notice the lines, that's one of the things we point out is that the lines are different on the shapes. We have to use a different kind of line to make a triangle and a circle. And my mouse is crazy. So yes, children are able to begin. Whenever we start pointing out these lines, they're going to start developing their shapes. Because if they can't tell the difference in a straight line and a curved line, they're not going to be able to tell the difference in your triangle and circle. That is our starting point, is for them to be able to see a difference and notice a difference and realize that that difference is important. All right. And I did not know I got all of these as early childhood questions, but I know some of the ones later in our thing aren't, so... All right, an EC teacher has children lie down on butcher paper in whatever body position they choose and outlines their body with a marker. Then the teacher has the children to enhance and personalize these outlines 
by drawing different kinds of lines with various tools. What is correct about this activity? So what are we gonna highlight first? That AC teacher. Uh -huh. We know she's outlining their shapes, right? Oops. And they're supposed to be using different kinds of lines with various tools. If I was highlighting, those were the things that I would want to pay attention to. Because those, to me, seem like the important things. Now, I may look at my answers choices and say, hey, maybe those aren't the right things. But for me, I always try to have some kind of starting point for whenever I look at my answer choices. So now let's look at our answer choices and see what we think. The children will learn how line is used in various visual art and drawing different kinds of lines. The children will not learn as much from this activity as from shapes that are not their own. The children will learn more about how shape is used in art than how lines are used. The children will learn uh, kinesthetic concepts from posing their body, but not anything with, uh, with art. Any of these that we want to eliminate immediately? The second and the fourth one. Yeah. I like this one. I'm like, um... We're definitely doing some art here. We're going to learn something about art. Let's see our second. The children will not learn as much from this activity as from shapes that are not their own. Yeah, well, we learn different things from both, right? Both of these concepts, whether it's your own shape or from some, something else, you're going to be able to learn from it. So we're going to go ahead and eliminate that one. What else? Do, what do we like? Okay, that leaves us two choices. So let's look at this one. The children will learn about how shape is used in art, not about lines. What do we think about this question? Is that the third one you're looking at? Yes. Yeah, I, I like that one. Because they Cause will learn talk, more about, shape, about. Right? And the children can walk around, see everybody's different shapes. Right? So, I mean, I can see how that's important and how they're going to learn about that. What we want to look at here is they will learn about how shape is used in art and about how lines are used. Okay. So, I'm going to put a question mark on that one. The children will learn how line is used in visual art and about drawing different kinds of lines. What do we think of this one? I kind of like this one. Why? Because they're um, personalizing their outlines by drawing different kinds of sh uh, lines with various tools. So they're doing like a lot of stuff with lines, in my opinion. Yes. The teacher is really focusing on lines. She is wanting them to do different line types. She's wanting them to use different tools. They are really focusing in on lines. Is she having them add shapes to their body? No. This whole activity, even though they're outlining their bo their body shape, that's just giving them a canvas to work on. Their main focus of this lesson seems to be the lines. Ooh, come on. I lost my mouse again. So, yes, this whole lesson is about lines. Even though they have their outline as a shape, they're not using shapes to change the art. They're using the different kinds of lines to change their art and to show different ways that it can be seen. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. And I am not doing very good on time today. We're not getting through the... But that's okay. There's a lot of immaterial I wanted to cover. And I know art's probably scarier than the PE or health for most people. All right, which of the elements of art would best describe direct the viewer's eye when representing this road in artwork? So when we see this road, which of these elements are is what directs your eye? The color, line, texture, or value? You say textures. There's a lot of textures. There is a lot of texture in this one. 
I kind of want to stay line because I'm focused on the curvy road. All right, so I'm going to turn on my highlighter real quick. So we're looking at which one's going to direct your eye. That was our key phrase that we needed to pay attention to. We've been representing this road, and we're talking mainly about the road. Because all of these things are, all of these things that they show are in this painting. There is different colors. There is different, there is the, the road has a line. There is lots of different textures, especially in the trees. And then they use di different values of the greens and the browns in order to be able to show you the leaves and stuff. But when we're look, thinking about the road, what's gonna, what causes your eye to move this way? Does the color affect how our eyes travel? No. No, not really. How about the value? How light or dark it is. Does that change where your eyes go on that road? I don't know, I guess. Not really. I mean... We know that the edge of the road is darker, but that doesn't really affect what makes your eye move. Because I don't know about you, but I started here, and my eye immediately traveled all the way that way. Even disappearing behind the trees. Like, I, my eyes just naturally went that way. All right, the texture. We The road does have a little bit of texture. I mean, you can see it's a little rocky. It looks like maybe it's a little muddy that's cracked. Does that texture change how your eyes travel? No. No. What really causes directs our eye for this paint thing is the line. This curvy line of the road. And we want to remember the lines can be curvy or straight. They can be wavy. They can be broken. They can even be implied. You may not see an actual line. Like this one, we have the road, which kind of makes a line, but there is no specific line that you're following. But the road causes us to follow that lot, curvy line. The way it's drawn. Oh, sorry, I'm just skipping ahead. All right, so health. Let's get into our next section. Um, what do we need to know about health? Uh, we want to make sure we're understanding the intersection of health and art, and that. It, it's a the, we want to make sure we're knowing that we're equipped with the knowledge about mental health, emotional expression, and how um health can affect our students. So health and wellness, uh, I want to make sure I put these two together because a lot of people confuse health and wellness. So health is going to be the elements of their actual medical condition, medical care prognosis. Wellness is how what is the knowledge in the perception related to the condition and, and the action you're taking this is the left, left is your physical aspects the right is how are you taking care of yourself and are you making sure you're staying well what are you doing to be actively engaged in maintaining good health all right mental health mental health has been like a really big topic lately in a lot of our schools, especially since COVID, it's really came to the forefront of teachers making keeping an eye on the mental health of their students. So I'm I have a lot of information in here for the mental health, but I probably won't go as deep into it just for the fact that I think all of us have had that topic a lot, just in our college career and in our classrooms of making sure that our but mental health encompasses the emotional, physiological, and social well being of individuals, uh, how they think, how they feel, how they act. It, it impacts their ability to cope with stress, relate to others, and make decisions. It's important for us to think about the mental health of our students and of ourselves because it's an integral part of academic success, their personal development, and their overall quality of life. It affects the student's ability to learn, form relationships, navigate their challenges. All right, some of the common mental health disorders. Um, we know anxiety disorders. 
These these include generalized anxiety disorders, social anxiety disorders, panic disorders. Sometimes the, the symptoms may be excessive worry, restlessness, physical symptoms such as rapid heartbeat, sweating, depression. Oh, I'm sorry. Depression's our next one. It's characterized by per persistent feelings of sadness, hopelessness, and the loss of interest or pleasure in activities. So the symptoms may include changes in appetite, sleep pattern, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, ADHD. Most of us have probably seen this in our classroom. <laughs> it involves difficulty sustaining attention, hyperactivity, and impuls uh, impulsiveness. The symptoms may manifest as difficulty following instructions, excessive fidgeting, impulsively interrupting others. And this is not the fact that your kindergartner won't sit there in their desk for an hour and listen to you. Because we know a kindergartner ain't supposed to sit still for an hour. But this is taking it to the extent where they just can't handle, like they have to constantly be fidgeting. They have to be interrupting. It's the excessiveness of it. Um, eating disorders... We often don't see these as much in the younger grades as you will in the older, but they involve include anorexia, uh, anorexia, bulimia, binge eating. These disorders involve unhealthy eating habits or unhealthy behaviors and attitude towards food and body image, and they can potentially lead to some pretty severe physical and psychological consequences. All right, recognizing signs and symptoms. Um, with your students, you want to make sure you're paying attention to all of these things. Are you noticing any changes in behavior? So noticeable changes in behavior patterns, such as increased irritability, aggression, withdrawal from their social activities. Are you paying attention for mood swings? And yes, this is on top of everything else on our plate, right? So we want to make sure that if there's any rapid fluctuations in their mood, including like sudden ex shifts from extreme highs and lows, Maybe this kid always comes in happy, and for some reason this week, they have came in and they're not wanting to talk to anyone. They're very unhappy. It's obvious something is going on with them. Um, social withdrawal, so they're avoiding social interactions, isolating from their peers or activities that they usually enjoy. Actim academic struggles, the decline in academic performance, uh, difficulty concentrating, lack of motivation to complete their assignments. Physical symptoms. Suddenly they're complaining of headaches, stomach aches, fatigue. These can, those physical symptoms can actually show it, tell us that sometimes indicate that there may be an emotional distress. I can tell you if you've ever subbed, if you go into a classroom as a sub, every student in there suddenly has a tummy ache. Everybody wants to go to visit the nurse. But, and it's really just that emotional distress of you are a new person invading their space. They don't know who you are, and it scares them. And they tell you this by saying, my tummy hurts. So we want to make sure we're creating a supporting environment for our students. Uh, we talk a lot about environment in all of our different teaching classes, but we want to make sure we're establishing a classroom culture that values diversity, inclusivity, and accepts all students. We want to make sure we're encouraging our students to express their thoughts, feelings, and provide opportunities for dialogue and mental health topics. It's okay for them to tell us that they're really sad today or that we want to make sure that it, we're allowing them to have those conversations. Uh, we want to make sure we're connecting students and families with a counselor, student counselor, or school counselor, sorry, mental health professionals and community resources for additional support as needed. And we want to make sure we're our students' advocates. We are advocating for students' mental health needs and promoting resilience and providing the safe, nurturing learning environment. Because it's our job to make sure that they're safe in our classroom and that they feel safe. If you see something's wrong, you need to be speaking up. And some, because sometimes those kids spend eight to 10 hours with us. A lot of times we see those kids more than their own parents do. Because at home, it's okay, it's time to eat dinner. We'll visit for an hour, play for an hour, and then it's bedtime. I mean, I can even tell you with my personal children, my 17 year old, he has a job in the evenings. I don't, during the week, I don't see him. 
Sometimes if I stay up late, I'll see him when he gets home. I may see him for 15 minutes a day. His teachers see him a lot more than I do. So we want to make sure as educators, as teachers, that we if we notice something's off, you may notice it's off before their parents even do. So you want to make sure you're being the student's advocate. And you're speaking up when you see something's wrong. And wrong may actually be too right. Maybe this student that's usually a little withdrawn, suddenly something's really different and they're extra happy. They're suddenly very, very outspoken. It doesn't always have to be on the negative signs. Some Sometimes something can change and it can be dramatically happier. So either way, make sure we're noticing those differences so we can keep an eye on it and speak up as needed. All right, uh, promoting wellness. Well, I can't even talk today. Sorry, guys. So these are some different things that we can do to promote wellness in our classroom. We, um, a lot of us, I know, especially in the elementaries, now have a social emotional curriculum that they use of some sort or some kind of activities that you can do um, when your brain breaks. One of my favorite ones to do is the freezing one and just letting them slow down and freeze their body and melt. You can do deep breathing exercises, different ways to help their mental wellness and give them that de-stress point. Help talk through the different social cues. Okay, Johnny wouldn't let you play in the playground. Let's talk about it. He doesn't want to be your friend anymore. Okay, let's talk about it. Why doesn't he want to be his friend? Oh, you punched him in the face and you told him he can't, that you don't like him? Okay, so why wouldn't he want to play with you if you did that? So we're talking through those different ideas because kids don't understand. They need help with that at first. And by talking through them, we're helping promote their well mental wellness. We're putting those thoughts into words. We're helping their thoughts and emotions and explaining them so that they can begin to understand them and they don't just get locked into them. All right, legal and ethical considerations. Um, student confidentiality. I know you probably all got that lecture at whenever you began student teaching. Um, we are le there are legal and eth ethical obligations regarding students' confidentiality and privacy rights. While we also have to make sure we're recognizing the importance of sharing information with the appropriate people for students' safety and well-being. I can't post on Facebook that Johnny looks depressed. Johnny was depressed today. But if I'm talking to the counselor and say, hey, can you have a conversation with Johnny? Can you check in with him? That's okay. So it's understanding the difference in it's okay to speak to the people that are needed to to get Johnny help. It's not okay just to take it to the public and to tell everyone. to be You can't discuss it at Walmart where anybody can hear. But it's okay to have that conversation with the people that need to, for, to ensure his safety and well-being. Mandating reporters reporting. Um, what, since you are in school, you should already know familiarize yourself familiarize yourself that with the mandated reporting laws and procedures. If you ever suspect, and I have the whole slide on it, any kind of abuse, neglect, or imminent harm that a student's going to do to themselves or others, you are required by law to report it. And I'll share the sad thing. Um. I was a daycare director before I started teaching or before I started finishing my education to teach. And we had a student that was a CPS kid. We knew they had active CPS cases. They were actually in grandma's custody. Dad wasn't allowed to visit with them at all. He was not supposed to be around them. We had documentation. We had been given documentation saying this because there was a dad had harmed the children before and they were concerned about it. Suddenly, Dad started picking up with Grandma. We noticed he was in the car. Grandma told us, oh, he just needs a ride. I'm just dropping him off. As a, man, as a mandated reporter, I had to call in and report to CPS that Dad was in the vehicle because of the fact that it put the children at risk. I've also had to call and report because I saw bruising on a child in a suspicious manner. We've heard, I've had students come in, we've, I've had seen a teacher this year that had a student come in and talk about 
and ex they were explaining that they had to take a shower, but the way they were explaining it was kind of an odd manner that didn't, something seemed off. Even, it's not our job to investigate why it's off, but it is our job to speak up for that student for, so that someone else that's trained correctly can go in and check to make sure everything is on the up and up. The first the first little boy I told you about, his didn't end very well. Whenever we called CPS, the grandma immediately removed the child from our care, our facility. They she claimed it's because we couldn't keep we weren't open late enough. We had police come two months later. Unfortunately, the dad had killed the little boy. So I mean, to me, that mandated reporting is so important because you never know. Yes, 90% of the time you're calling and it may not be anything. But if you feel like something is off, you have to call because of that 1% chance that for this little boy, everything wasn't okay. Um, accommodations. Sorry, guys, I can get into a whole lecture on that just because I have so personal experience on that side of things. Accommodations. Um, I know y'all probably seen 504s and or IEPs, or at least you've had heard your teachers mention them, even if you're not on the SPED side of things. Those are legal accommodations. We are required by law, if it's in those papers, to give the children those support. If it says that your child is supposed to be getting manipulatives for their math papers and their math stuff, you're required by law to give them the manipulatives. So make sure you're doing that. All right. Sorry, guys. Get off of my little tangent, tangent there. Um, signs of abuse, what to look, do and what to look for. So we want to look uh, um, look for bru odd bruises. Suddenly, your uh, second and third graders having a lot of accidents or toileting issues. Um, they're consistently dirty. I've, you know, I've had students come in before smelling of weed. Or come in smelling of a dirty diaper when they don't even wear a diaper. So it's obviously something was wrong. They're not getting clean the way they should be. If a student has frequent bone breaks or frequent accidents, we want to make sure we're paying attention to that and saying something about that. Um, ask. Talk to your kids. Know your kids. We always want to listen and believe our kids. We If they're telling us something, even if Johnny tells stories, my own daughter at one point told her teacher that we li I made her live in a tent outside in the rain when really I had taken her camping. And yes, I made her stay in the tent even though it rained on us. But you always want to believe the kids because there's usually some line of truth. Even if, like for my daughter, it was one night she had to stay in a tent. Not every day. And I was with her. But you always want to believe those stories. Because you may be the one person that they're trying to tell the truth to when no one else will listen. We always want to err on the uh, side of filing a report. If you have a gut feeling that something isn't right, call. And they, uh, everyone should have access to the phone number. You can Google it. They also will let you fill out the form online. If you Nowadays, you can actually go to their website and you can file a report online if you don't want to call. Because I know they put you on hold and make you wait forever. All right. Now that we've gotten to that side, let's get away from the negative side of things. All right. So nutrition. We know nutrition is important. It plays a crucial role in maintaining health and well-being. We want to make sure that uh, we're teaching children about how nutrition can support their growth and development, their immune function and cognitive function. Um, we want to know the basic concepts of nutrition, like your macro and micro, you have a balanced diet. Um, we want to make sure we're modeling healthy behaviors to our students and teaching our students, um, about the importance of making healthy cho food choices and understanding food labels, about exercising, all of these things. We want to create the supportive environment so that they can grow and provide access to their water, provide access to these healthy options. All right. Six essential nutrients. These are going to be our main nutrients. Um, we know protein's going to typically be our meats or beans. 
And this is going to provide the building blocks for bones and muscles. I liked this visual because it seemed to give all the key information in one spot. Um, carbohydrates are broken down for our energy. And it's good for our heart and gut. Lipids provide the support and insulation we need. Water helps transport our nutrients and other molecules. We do a lot more than that. Um, vitamins are going to help break down our food particles. And minerals help also help break down our food particles. All right, our skeletal systems. And this is at a very big glance. <laughs> not all of these we see all the time. Not all of these. A lot of these aren't even probably going to show up in your test. But it's a good idea to know what they are. Because you may get one or two questions that uh, ask you about a, how a different body system is being used. So our skeletal system provides the structural support and protection for the body's organs. This is going to be your bones, joints, cartilage, and ligaments. It's going to involve movement, support, and protection of vital organs, and the protection of blood cells. Our muscular system is responsible for the movement, stability, and maintaining posture. It's going to consist of skeletal muscles, uh, smooth muscles, and cardiac muscles. And the functions include voluntary movements, skeletal mu muscles involves, and involuntary movements, such as your smooth muscles and pumping blood. Your nervous system coordinates and controls the different body functions through electrical impulses and chemical signals. This is going to be your brain, your spinal cord, your nerves, your sensor, sensory organs. Your circulatory system uh, transports your nutrients, oxygen, hormones, and waste products throughout the body. And this consists of your heart and your blood vessels in your blood. Your digestive system, we know what that one is. This helps process our food and absorb nutrients and also eliminate waste. Our immune system helps defend the body against our pathogens, such as bacteria, viruses, and parasites, or foreign subjects, or foreign substances. The into, into, I cannot talk. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. Our eye system protects us from the bo body from physical damage, pathogens, and dehydrations. And that's your skin, your hair, your nails, and your sweat glands. Your urinary system helps remove your waste products and excessive fluids from the body. But each of these systems have a unique role in making sure our body works and functions correctly. Um, they work together and help us in everyday life. Um, pretty much knowing an overall of, of what each one does and what it consists of. If you know that the uh, circular system is the one that does your blood, you can remember that's going to be your heart and your blood vessels. So just knowing their main function helps you know what they do and what they're made of. All right, physical activity. So physical activity, we want to make sure we're maintaining overall health, teaching our kids uh, the importance that physical activity helps us maintain overall health. It also helps us reduce the risk of getting certain diseases, um, such as obesity, heart disease, diabetes. We want to encourage our students to engage in activity by incorporating movement breaks. It's not... Activity isn't just for PE and recess. During your class, do those brain breaks. Help them get their body moving. And you're going to see a lot better work in your students just by getting that blood flowing. So we want to make sure we're including that in our regular class. And we want to encourage them to do physical activities that they enjoy and incorporate that into their daily life. All right, let's get into some questions. So I feel like I've been talking a long time again. So which of the six essential nutrients help repair and build tissue? So we glanced at these. What do we think, guys? Anything we can eliminate? Maybe eliminate the minerals. Okay. Do we remember what the minerals did?
It's okay important to say Important for bodily functions. Yeah, they just have, the minerals help us break down the food and the other stuff. So we know it's not minerals. What do carbohydrates do? Something for energy? Yeah, carbohydrates have to do with giving us energy. Okay. What do fats do? Store energy? Are fats one of our six essential nutrients? No. No. Fats are important. They do give us energy and support cell function, but they're not one of our essential nutrients. Oh, come on. It's so easy to lose this mouse, guys, because it shows up as a tiny, tiny dot on my screen. I don't know if you can even see it. And then I have to try to figure out where it went. <laughs> All right. So that leaves us with one option, proteins. So, yes, our proteins are going to be the ones that help re uh, repair and build the tissue. All right. Let's look at our next one. Involuntary body functions such as breathing, digestion, heart rate, and blood pressure are controlled by the blank system. What do we think of this question? Don't like it because mm -hmm. this isn't fair. You told me just to know the general stuff. I'm thinking maybe like the second or the third one. Okay. What makes you lean towards those? Because the second, like auto, autonomic, I don't know what it is, but like the auto makes me think like this should be automatic. Like you don't have yes. to consciously think about it i yes, don't know what the somatic is cerebrum i know that's like a part of the brain yeah we know that's and part of our central brain. nervous system just sounds good yeah we like the fact this one sounds like automatic all right does everybody agree with her kind of train of thought yes all right so yes this is part of our brain so we know that's not correct Central is going to be your main nervous system, your uh, the nerves that run through your body. And this first one, the somatic nervous system, it's a subdivision of your nervous system that stretches throughout your body. It's the uh, part of your nerves that deliver. It's trying to think of the way best way to explain. It's the the part of your nerves that help your senses understand things and take those senses to the brain. Like whenever you touch something and it's hot, your somatic nervous system is what set tells your brain that it's hot. So yes, this is going to be our uh, automatic or autonomic nervous system. The things that are happening automatically without us take, doing any effort. So use your word clues like she did. We don't know what those things are, and that's why I threw this one in. But if we're using our clue, word clues, we can guess, make a good guess, and eliminate choices. All right, foods that are rich in fiber include... What do we think of this one? I say beans and whole wheat bread. All right. Everybody agree, disagree? I agree. Yes. We know our vi milk and orange juice, that's going to have a lot of vitamins. Um, the others, I'm not even sure what you would say they have a lot of, or even if they have fiber. For me, the giveaway was the whole wheat bread. Just because I think of whenever I buy bread, it always, uh, they make a big deal that it has fiber in it on the package. So I always see that on the label. 
So for me, that's what makes it easy for me to figure out that, oh yeah, bread has a lot of fiber in it. So that means this is probably my correct choice. All right, so let's look at the next one. Each of the following behaviors is associated with reducing the risk of chronic disease, except what do we what do we need to do for this question? Sound like except? Yes, we want to make sure we pay attention to this except. And we're looking at what reduces the risk of chronic disease. All right, so what do we think of our choices? Eating a diet high in unsaturated fats. Is that important, not important? Not sure. I would say maybe no. Okay. Diet high in fats, we think, mm, I'm not sure about that. So we're going to put a question mark on it because we're not sure. Exercising at least 150 minutes per week. Is that something we're supposed to do or not supposed to do? Is it going to help us or not help us? I think that would be too much. Well, 150, think, if you think that's less than uh, 30 minutes a day. Seven days a week? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're saying exercise less than 30 minutes a day. Telling our kids to exercise less than 30 minutes a day. Okay. No, I would eliminate that. Is that something we're supposed, are kids supposed to exercise 150 minutes per week? <laughs> this is something we want our kids to do. We want to make sure they're exercising at least 150 minutes a week. Preferably more, but we want them to do this. Okay. Consuming no more than one or two glasses of alcohol per day. Hopefully this is adults, not children. Is this going to help reduce the risk of disease? I don't think so. Okay. You know what's hard is that accept. That gets me every time. Sleeping at least seven hours per night. Yes, I would say. This is something we want our kids to do. Yes. Or we want to do for ourselves, I guess I should say. Since it throws the alcohol in there, I probably shouldn't say for our kids. All right. So then we got down these two choices. Do we want to make sure they're eating a diet high in unsaturated fats or consuming no more than one to two glasses of alcohol per day? Because in reality, all of these behaviors are things we that we should be doing, correct? All of these look like good choices. That's why I say some of these questions feel like they're trick questions because all of our answer choices are good questions. All of these things are things we do, are behaviors that we want to follow. What gets us here was not actually the accept it's the fact that we're trying to reduce the chronic diseases. Now, our chronic diseases are going to be your diabetes, your obes uh, obesity, ugh, obesity, and your type 2 diabetes. So all of, we want to think about which one of these are actually helping reduce that risk. Um, yes, it is important that you eat a diet high in unsaturated fats. The un being in the important part because saturated fats are horrible for you. But unsaturated fats, such as like your avocado, are actually good for you. Uh, those are considered brain foods that help you out a lot. So that's actually important that we do, that we're doing. We aren't supposed to become alcoholics. Of course, that's bad for us. But that doesn't help us reduce the risk of disease. Even though this is good practice right here, 
It doesn't help us reduce the risk of disease, chronic disease. So our correct choice here was actually this uh, alcohol one. I said, this is one of those really weird trick, almost trick questions. Because it's not the one you thought it would have been initially. <laughs> All right. Let's look at another one. Lecturing is best suited for teaching which of the following? Whoops, I should have put this in with the PE, but that's okay. We're going to go ahead and do it since it's here. Um, exercises for flexibility, rules of a game or sport, or the ethics use of steroids, best motions in a sport. So let's think about each of these individually. Because they're talking about lecturing. If we are teaching exercises for flexibility, how do, how should, what is the best way to teach that? Through demonstration and example? Yeah. So it's going to be leading or showing the students. Okay. Come on. How about the ethical use of steroids? I think that would be good for lecturing. Or I'm sorry, the ethics of steroids. All right. Maybe in our younger grades, but let's think if you have a high, like my son plays wrestling. So let's think about our high school wrestling or football team. When they're really trying to build those muscles, what's going to be our best way to teach them about the ethics of steroid use? And I'm going to put a question mark because we said maybe lecturing. But is there another way that would be better for that? How about a guided discussion? Because yes, we could we could lecture for that. But a guided discussion where the students are actually giving and taking some. And hey, yeah, it's gonna help you build muscle. But let's talk about that. Is that the right way to build muscle? And letting them give their opinions and really give and take with the conversation, they're probably gonna get more out of it. All right, how about the uh, basic motions in a sport? So you're teaching them about volleyball this week and, show, and teaching them how to serve the ball. Is um, How are we going to do that? Probably the same as the first one where we're leading by example. Yeah, we're going to lead by example. We're going to have to show them. All right, how about the rules of a game or sport? I think I like that one. Yeah, something like that one looks really good. Yes. Yeah. Um, whenever we think about we're, we're teaching kids about the a get new game or sport that you're going to play, you're probably going to lecture them. You're probably going to do the whole group discussion of, hey, this is how we play. This is what you need to know. That I, that I do, where you're give, telling them everything. And they're just sitting there listening until it's over. So, yes, the rules of a game or sport would be our correct answer. We're going to have to go through PE fast since we only have like 30 minutes left, but that's okay. I think I think it's less slides. All right. So goals and objectives of PE. We want to make, uh, make sure we're helping promote the physical fitness of our students. We want to, uh, PE aims to promote physical fitness by providing students with opportunities to engage in a variety of physical activities that enhance their cardiovascular health, their muscular strength, their endurance, their flexibility, mainly their overall physical well-being. We want them to learn about the importance of regular exercise, proper nutrition and health, like all the things we talked about in the last section, and how physical fitness can help their life. We want to make sure we're developing motor skills, their fine motor and their gross motor. Uh, we want to help students develop those fundamental motor skills such as running, jumping, throwing, catching, kicking, and striking because these skills are going to be important for them. 
We also want to make sure we're helping increase their balance, agility, spatial awareness, their coordination. We want to make sure they're getting some social interactions, of course, and learning how to do conflict resolution and build positive relationships with each other and good sportsmanship. And we want to really instill that lifelong habit of physical activity. Because the more they enjoy it as they're young, the more likely they are to continue. Um, we talked a lot on the last question about uh, different ways we can teach and demonstrate skills. Uh, we know we can model and demonstrate proper techniques and skills by providing visual examples for our students. We know we can provide feedback and constructive feedback and correction to help our students, including positive reinforcement. We want to make sure we're differentiating instruction and accommodating our students, providing modified equipment, assistive devices, whatever we need for students that may have a physical disability or a limitation. Make sure we're offering choices to our students and giving clear expectations. And we want to make sure that uh, we're doing positive reinforcement and rewarding students for following the rules and exhibiting good sportsmanship. So I'm trying to get through these fast because I know some of this is going to be a little longer. So I want to make sure I have time for the things that I need to discuss that are more important. Um, safety and injury prevention. Of course, we want to make sure we're using uh, proper warm-up and cool-down techniques. Make sure we're teaching students how to use the equipment properly. And we're making sure all, that all the equipment's being maintained correctly. We want to make sure we're prepared for emergencies. What happens if a kid were to fall and hurt the wrist, potentially break it? Do you know what you're supposed to do? You want to make sure you're showing that teaching them proper techniques and form during physical activity so there's less likely to get the risk of injury. And we want to make sure we're doing progressive training. So we're gradually increasing the intensity and duration of the activities. You're not going to start out at the beginning of the season having kids do the same thing you would in the middle of the season. You have to have that starting point and build up to it because they don't have the same strength and skills that they do at the middle and end. Um, inclusion and differentiation. We've talked about this a lot, so I'm not even going to get into it really today. It's just making sure that you're accommodating for all students and that you're prepared for all the different fitness levels. Not every student can run the mile in eight minutes. So you need to make sure you're prepared for that and that you're allowing for those differences. We're pushing our students to be their best, but we're also uh, differentiating to accommodate for what we need to. Um, assessment methods, we have skills assessments where you're seeing if the students are proficient in specific skills or techniques. Uh, fitness training, this is going to be where we measure our students' physical components, such as their cardio, their endurance, their strength, their flexibility, and their body composition. Um, performance evaluations assess students' performance and practical tasks, such as participating in a team sport or a dance routine. Self-assessments, we want to encourage our students to reflect on their own progress and set their own goals and monitor their own physical le uh, activity levels and their own improvements. And I'm going to get more into goal setting in a second. All right, we've already talked a lot about how to promote healthy lifestyles, but um, with PE, we're really just connecting that. We're connecting those dots for students. All right, cardiovascular fitness. This is uh, going to be fit. This, ugh. this is also called aerobic fitness. It refers to the ability of the heart, lungs, and circulatory system to deliver oxygen to working muscles. So it's a key component of physical fitness, and it's associated with numerous health benefits. It's going to help reduce that chronic disease, improve your heart health. It's going to help enhance weight management. And the way we remember this, this is going to be any di disease that helps get your body moving. You want to get your heart pumping. So we have aerobic and anaerobic exercises. Aerobic exercises, this is the cardio exercise. It's the activity that involves our heart moving, like getting that heart beating faster, like we talked about, for an extended time. 
Um, the some of the benefits, like I just mentioned, uh, were cardiovascular health, weight management, and it also enhances their mood and well mental well being. But we also have the anaerobic exercise. These are shorter, more intense uh, physical activity. You can't do these for a long time. Your body wouldn't be able to handle it. Um, it does not rely on oxygen for energy, but rather it uses the stored energy. So examples of some anaerobic exercises for children would be sprints or jumping or weightlifting or um, the interval training. These are going to help build their muscles. It's going to increase their bone density, increase their speed and agility, but it's also going to promote uh, metabolic health to help burn their calories. And I did a video on the locomotive, or I found a video I really liked on locomotive, locomotor and non-locomotor. Because to me, this did a lot. I, like I've said before, I don't recreate the wheel. So if somebody else does it really good, I just share it with y'all so that y'all can watch their video and learn it from them. Tell me if y'all can't hear it. Can we hear it? No. Okay. I couldn't remember if I clicked the right button or not. So, all right. I'm going to have to stop the share for a second. And reshare. All right. Looking at the differences between locomotor skills and non-locomotor skills. Can we hear it this time? Our bodies can move in yes. okay. ways. Moving our bodies is important to stay healthy. When we move, we are either doing a locomotor movement or a non-locomotor movement. A locomotor movement, like a train, is when you do not stay in the same place. Some locomotor movements that your body can do are dancing, galloping, jumping, running, and skipping. All of these locomotor movements take you to different places. When you are performing locomotor movements, it's important to have your own personal space or personal boundaries. You need lots of space for locomotor movements. When you run, you need lots of space. When you skip or gallop, you need lots of space you certainly don't want to run into someone or something. A non-locomotor movement is when your feet stay in the same place. Your upper body, though, can move in many different ways. Some non-locomotor movements that your body can do are swaying your arms like a tree, holding your arms out and twisting, stretching as far as you can reach, and swinging your arms in big circles. Remember when you do non-locomotor skills, you don't need that much space. Unlike locomotor skills where you need lots of space, you just need to make sure when you are doing non-locomotor skills that you can't reach anything or anyone around you. You move your body every day. If you move to another place, it is locomotor movement. If you stay in the same place, it is non-locomotor movement. What are your favorite ways to move your body? Now it is time to go to the next assignment in your- All right, I'm gonna stop it right there. But to me, that just broke it down a lot easier than- Module. Oh, I'm all right, so circuit training. Circuit training involves performing a, a series of strength, cardiovascular, and flexibility exercises in a sequence with minimum rest between stations. So you might have kids doing some strength stuff like body uh, weight exercises, such as push-ups, squats, or lunges. You might have them doing cardiovascular exercises like jumping or jogging in place or even some anaerobic exercises such as sprinting or jumping rope before they move to the next activity. All right. 
And circuit training is really good for our kids, especially um, as they get older. You'll see it a lot in their PE classes because it has a lot of benefits and considerations. And I'm just going to glance at those. I'm not going to get into deep because we still have a lot more to cover. All right, SMART goals. NP NPE, just like anything else, we want to make sure we're setting SMART goals. Are your, Is your goal specific enough that you can say exactly what you're looking for? Is it measurable? It should have include criteria for being able to measure progress and success. So, for example, we can't just say we want to run faster. We have to be able to say I'm going to decrease my mile run time by 30 seconds within the next month. So we want to make sure how are you able to measure that goal? Is it achievable? I'm five foot tall. If I said I wanted to be become the best player, basketball player in the world, probably not not very achievable for me. Because I'm only five foot tall and I got an extra 150 pounds on me. So that's probably not going to be something I can attain right now. But I can say I want to make a basketball team and or I want to um, work on improving my basketball skills. That would be more obtainable for me. Is it relevant to the students? Is it important to them? If I'm telling them they have to improve their, vi uh, learn to play the violin, but they hate playing music, that doesn't help them. That's not relevant to them. And is it timely? We want to make sure all of our goals are time bound. They should have a specific time frame or deadline for completion. Because this is going to give us a sense of urgency and accountability. It's going to help them stay focused and motivated to work towards. You. All right, so let's get into some questions. Which of the following has been shown to foster lifelong physical activity? Competence in physical activities, modeling physical activity, participating in organized sports, or having active parents. What do we think of this one? Anything we can eliminate? You could eliminate the first one. You want to eliminate the first one? Mm hmm It's like, yeah, maybe they are good at kicking the ball or throwing the ball, but like, are they interested in it? Is it going to, yeah, are they interested in kicking the ball? Okay. I can see why we're thinking eliminate that one. All right, I'm going to start here at the bottom. Having active parents. If you have active parents, is that going to uh, foster a lifelong physical? Is it going to make you have a lifelong interest in physical activity? No. No, not necessarily. I can tell you the things my mom loves are not all, are not all the same things I love. How about participating in organized sports? would say no on that too yeah my 14 year old i had them in sports when they were really little i made all of my kids do sports because to me that was important i wanted to try and foster that lifelong physical activity i've tried that one i can tell you now my 14 year old now her favorite sport is sitting on her bed in her room and watching tv she hates getting up the fact that i'm gonna make her go outside today she's gonna get mad at me and give me attitude she hates having to get up and be active. So even though I put her in sports when she was little. So no, unfortunately, putting them in sports does not always guarantee they're going to have that lifelong passion for physical activity. How about modeling physical activity? Yes and no. Yeah, we want to show them how to do physical activity, but just because we show a kid how to do something, are they going to do that for the rest of their lives? Probably not. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking even 
for me, it ain't physical activity, but I think I clean my house all the time. I've shown my kids a million times how to do the dishes. <laughs> but I can't for the life of me get them to just do it themselves, no matter how many times I model it. The so love leads us back at this first one, confidence and physical activities. Um, confidence, if the kids are getting really good at it and they're happy and feel good about it, I want you to think about the things in your life that you feel good about. That, hey, I'm good at this. Are the things that you're good at things that you want to continue doing in your life? It depends if I can make money off of it. Yeah, I mean, making money helps. But t typically, if, if we're good at something and we feel confident in it, and we know, hey, I'm really good at this, we're going to want to keep doing that. Because, I mean, it's human nature for us to want to do things that we're good at. If we suck at something, for lack of better words, we don't want to do it very often. <laughs> but yeah, our uh, correct answer here is actually going to be this first one. If The more we encourage things and build up their competence and help them feel better about it, the more they're going to have want to do it as they get older and continue doing it. All right. Which of the following accurately describes the cardiovascular activity recommendations for uh, elementary age children? And this was one of those trick questions, especially with all the ads out there. So what do we think of this one? Typically, one of the answers with the accumulation. Okay, why? Because it's like when you don't expect a kindergartner to sit still for like a whole hour. I don't think you can get them to continuously, unless it's like a sport maybe. But like if they're just like, you know, running in place, doing jumping jacks for like an hour, I think they might lose interest really quickly. Exactly. And they're going to get tired. I mean, you're saying even with the sport... Okay, let's think of, I don't know if, how many of y'all have younger children or you went to see younger kids play sports. Or even our older kids, trying to get them to run on that soccer field, even for their 30 or 45 minute game, they can't do it the whole time. They have to tag out. They have to have someone rotate in for them. We can't. They're going to have any bouts that are longer than 15, 20 minutes are not developmentally appropriate for younger children. They're going to fatigue too fast. So we know we want one of the answers of that have the accumulation because it's okay to break it that activity down. They don't have to do it all at once. So we're going to go ahead and delim eliminate the two that have continuous activity. So then we're going to go, is it 30 minutes or 60 minutes? So what do we think, guys? I know nobody wants to answer because nobody wants to be wrong. Uh, but it's going to be our 60 minutes. For our elementary age kids, we want them to get them moving at least 60 minutes a day. Even if it's only two or three minutes here or there, just enough to get their heart rate up, we want to make sure we're getting them moving at least 60 minutes a day. They used to say 30. That 30 used to be the number they tell us. And it changed. I don't remember when it changed because I remember it being 30 when I grew up when I was in school. But now they say they want kids to have at least 60 minutes a day of physical activity, of cardiovascular activity. All right. When is it a good idea to have students perform circuit training? What do we think about these answer choices? Right, so only when students are recovering from injuries. We like it, don't like it.
probably don't like it because of the word only. Yeah. We don't want students to only do circuit training when they're recovering from injuries. That needs to be done all the time. So when begin students are just beginning to exercise regularly. This is another one of those only type answers. We want them to be doing it all through. I mean, my, I can tell you my seventh grader does it and my 11th grader do it. They do it at the beginning of the year. Not as much. It's mainly in the middle and end of their season when they've already learned how to do each of the exercises correctly. So now we're going to work on rotating through them. So at all fitness levels from beginning to advanced. I know one of y'all said that y'all taught pre-K. Would your are your pre-Kers all capable of doing circuit training? No. No. If I have jump ropes on one side and I'm telling them to do push-ups on the other and run on this side, they're not going to be able to rotate quickly between those stations. Our beginners are not going to get that. So when students are used to regular physical activity. Yes. Once we have students that are accustomed to doing things on a regular basis, we've taught them how to do each of the activities correctly. They practice each of the activities. Then we can start doing the circuit training with them. Which of the following is not a good way to maximize participation in a physical education class? Well, this is going to be one of, another one of those not questions that nobody likes. change the rules of games to suit different skill levels is that going to encourage people to play I would say no um... alright let's think of this our kindergartners versus our fifth graders when we're teaching them about basketball do we kind of alter the game a little bit in order to make it easier for our kindergartners? Or do we expect them to follow the same set of rules that our fifth graders do? We might change it a little bit, right? If a kindergartner takes a couple steps with the ball, we're not going to make them give it up. If they're trying, we're, we're not going to hold it against them. We're going to encourage them to dribble, but if they take a few steps, that's okay. Now, when you're getting into your older grades, no, that's traveling. We're going to teach them that rule. So we're going to build on those rules as they get older. But yes, for right now, this is okay. So I'm going to put, actually, I'm not going to confuse you. I'm not going to put check mark. I don't want us confused. So I'm going to say this is okay. All right. Set up different activity stations for students to use. What do we, we think about this one? Uh, I like that because it's giving them choices. Yeah. We want to give our students choices. So you, you don't want to play basketball. That's okay. You can go over there and play with the dancing ribbons. You can go dance to the music. You can go run and chase your friends and play tag. We want to give them different options to choose. Okay. How about group the students according to skill level? I think that's kind of negative. It can be negative. But I want to ask you a question. Do you play any sports? No. Or, or did you play any sports when you were younger? Soccer. Soccer? Or dance. Were you, were but... you, ama were you amazing at soccer or just okay? Oh, gosh, that was like kindergarten. I don't even remember. Okay. I think we were just playing just to play, you know. What if I put you out there with the best soccer players? Soccer players that have been playing, pretty much they seem like they were born with a soccer ball. How are you going to, are you going to want to keep playing with them? Probably not. Probably not. So if we know we have students that are dramatically different Maybe these kids are just learning how to play versus kids that play play it on a regular basis for a club team. We don't want to put those students together because they're not going to get encouraged. If you put me with somebody that's amazing at basketball, I'm going to have no interest in playing. 
And sure, I like to dribble occasionally and throw the ball, but I know I suck. <laughs> I'm okay with sucking at it. I want to play because it's fun, but if you put me with these people that are super intense and like it's life to them, I'm not going to want to play. Because it's no fun to always be the loser or when people take it so seriously. So yeah, I mean, it's okay to group our students according to skill. To a degree. I mean, we don't want to dramatically always put a, make a kid feel like they are the worst. But if they're with kids that are still learning, then they realize they're not the only learning kid. So how about let each student choose his or her own activity as long as it's physical? What do we think about this one? They're given choices. So we like the fact we're giving choices. Oops, where did my mouse go again? There it is. So we like the fact they're getting to choose. But one thing we didn't highlight up here is that we're trying to maximize participation. Are we getting the most out of every single student? I make my kids go outside. My personal kids, I make them go outside every, every weekend. I, we're not home very much during the week, so I can't do anything about it the weekend. But I make them go outside for 30 minutes every weekend. My middle daughter, and now my youngest has started it, my middle one takes her phone outside and sits outside on her phone. So that technically she is meeting my limit of being outside but is she actually particip mac doing a maximum participation? Definitely not. My youngest might walk back and forth with her cat because she likes to play with her animals. So she'll take her cat for walks because it follows her around everywhere. But that's all she'll do. She's technically being physical, but is that maximizing her participation in class? Or in my instance at home, but, but is that that's a physical activity. Would that be maximizing her participation? Uh, no. No. Even though we're allowing our kids to have a choice, and we're the fact that we're may on, our only limit is they have to do something physical, we're not maximizing their participation. And th that's one of the things about this question that made it a trick question. They want to know which one helped maximize participation in the class. Without that word, all of these are good for physical activity, but only one of that one's the one that does not help them maximize that participation. All right, let's look at another one. I know we're running out of time here. So if y'all need to go, you're more than welcome to. I think this is the last question. Let me look see. Nope, I got two more. Right, which of the following best describes how participation in physical education can improve a student's self-esteem? So how does it help improve their self-esteem? Teaches students new or improved skills. It can foster a sense of wonder at human athleticism. Can teach students to take turns while playing sports or games. Or can release the endorphins of the feel-good chemicals. Any of these we want to eliminate immediately. I kind of want to eliminate the second and the third one. Yeah, these two we can pretty much eliminate. We know these probably aren't right. They don't sound right. So then we get into it can release the endorphins or the feel-good chemicals. Or it can teach students new or improved skills. I like the last one. Mm -hmm. But really, we want to make sure we're looking for which one's going to help their self-esteem. Oh, so this last one right here, and this is one of those trick questions because when we read it, both of those answers look good, right? And that's one of our clues that this is kind of a trick question is if you seem to have two answers that really work, then you're missing one of your key words. And on this one, it was, we want to make sure we're improving their self-esteem. Uh, which of the following best describes how participation in PE can improve their self-esteem? This right here, uh, the endorphins making them feel good. This helps them get a good mood. It's going to put them in a good mood. It's not really going to help their self-esteem. These endorphins just help our mood. They don't change your self-esteem. So um, 
whenever you ac accomplish learning something new, even if you're finishing this, once you pass this test, you feel like you've accomplished something. You've learned new skills. You've learned some new material. It's going to help your self-esteem. So this top answer is going to be our correct one, even though I've lost my mouse again. Whenever we're, whenever we're helping them with PE, them learning their new skills and improving their skills is going to help their self-esteem. All right, which of the following risk factors does not contribute to a non-commutable disease? So does gender affect us? We're going to go through these fast. Does gender affect our chance of a disease? No. Yes. Men and women have different, I mean, you think even like breast cancer, women are more likely to get breast cancer than men. Even though men can get it. So yes, gender can change it. How about an unhealthy diet? Can that contribute to disease? Non-commutable disease. Yes, if I'm eating bad food, I'm more likely to get a disease, a non-communicable disease, like diabetes. All right, how about tobacco use? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know if we're using tobacco, we're more likely to get lung cancer or something like that, right? So international travel. Even though we can get diseases from traveling, those are communicatable diseases, diseases you catch from other people. So non-communicatable diseases, diseases that you can't catch from other people are going to come from your gender, are going to come from that unhealthy lifestyle, are going to come from tobacco use, but they're not going to come from travel. All right. You want to develop students' object control and locomotor skills. Which of the following is the best way to do this? So require the students to describe shot put technique. No, if they're just... No. Yeah, just them telling it to you is not going to actually show you that they know it. Ask the student to throw a frisbee. Maybe. Remember, locomotor. Is the child physically moving? They are not, no. Nope. So that does not help us with locomotive. Lead the students in different kinds of dance. I don't know if that has something to do with object control. Right. That's going to help us with a locomotor, but it doesn't help us with object control. Depending on the type of dance, there are some that you use objects, but not all dances. Have the student play a game of catch. Sure. Especially if you're playing with those younger kids, right? You're going to be walking and running to catch the ball every single time they throw it. So, yes. Uh, playing a game of catch is going to help us with object control and the locomotor skills. Sorry, I thought I was done. I guess this is our last one. Um, a woman with a family of history of breast cancer who wants to lower her risk of cancer should do which of the following? Or I'm sorry, should do all of the following except. All right, so let's look at these real quickly. Should she get tested to see if she has a mutation that could give the breast cancer mutation? Yes. Yes, that's something she should do. Should she get regular screenings? Yes. Yes. Should she limit alcohol? Oh, probably. Yeah. I'm going to put question mark, but yeah, we know probably she should. So I'm going to put question mark, yes. Should she refrain from breastfeeding her infant? I would say no. No. Even though she has that history of breast cancer, her whether or not she breastfeeds her infant isn't going to change her risk of cancer. 
um, alcohol consumption is one of those iffy things because, but they do say if you consume more alcohol, you're get a more likely to get cancer of some type. So that's where that iffy thing comes in. But no, the bottom one, the breastfeeding is not going to help her reduce her risk. That's going to be the big one. Big red flag right there. All right. So that is it for today. Did y'all have any questions for me? Oh, let me pause. Let me stop the sharing before. Stop. Where is it? The recording. <laughs>